So now we're going to hear from Ron Bodkin from the Vector Institute to learn about applying AI research. Please stay tuned for the Q&A session after each speaker because the best question asked at the end of the presentation during the Q&As will be awarded a limited edition QKI sweater. We will announce the best question at the end and if selected, please send an email to, to chair at qki.ca with your mailing information and the school that you come from. Here's Ron. Thanks, Berkeley, and it's great to see everyone here virtually this morning. Um, as Berkeley mentioned, I'm excited to talk about applying AI, but in line with the theme of the conference with an emphasis on how to do so in a responsible way. Um, in my career, after studying at McGill and MIT covering uh, computer science and math with a focus on AI, I spent a lot of time as an entrepreneur. Uh, I've been working in the field of applying machine learning for about 15 years, starting at a company called Quantcast. Um, and I was excited to take on a role at the schwartz Reisman Institute and Vector Institute, uh, focusing on engineering, which is applying AI in a responsible way. Uh, so I've been doing that about the last six months. Um, and let me tell, talk to you a little bit about the field. So what I wanna talk to you today is quick introduction to Vector um, and some of the trends in AI. I'll talk a little bit about some of the areas of application of research a little bit about the challenges um, in, in uh, AI, both in terms of adoption and in terms of some, especially the focuses on some of the ethical challenges, and then some thoughts on how we can really uh, apply techniques and in in process to be more responsible. So with that in mind, the Vector Institute is one of three pan-Canadian AI institutes focused on driving excellence and leadership in AI in Canada both to foster the growth of the economy and improve the lives of Canadians, with an emphasis on doing so in a responsible way. It's an independent not-for-profit funded by the federal government, the provincial government, and industry sponsors, uh, with engagement with not only large companies, but also rich engagement with startups. So that's a little bit about the Vector Institute. Um, it, uh, the chief scientific advisor, Jeff Hinton, needs no introduction to this crowd, and we're certainly excited to have him uh, be uh, a luminary behind the Institute. More broadly, uh, you know, there's over 500 researchers at the Vector Institute from many of the top universities across Ontario and beyond. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, a lot of rich ideas and fantastic work happening at the Vector Institute. And we're certainly excited about being a place where so much great research is happening, but also engaging closely with industry partners, startups, healthcare partners, and, and the broader community around how can you translate AI research into meaningful impact in uh, applications, whether it be commercial or for a greater good. Now, before I talk about some of the areas that we're seeing, that I'm seeing that are especially of interest, there is a rapid increase <clears throat> in the applications of AI, specifically techniques based on deep learning. It's worth observing a couple of things. One is we're seeing uh, a continuation of applying new and improved techniques and AI modeling, right? So if you look at the example of natural language processing, but this trend is actually happening in many areas of uh, machine learning research, you've seen continued improvement of adopting new techniques. So this is an example of how uh, the shift from LSTMs for dealing with sequences of uh, words and languages, language models to the use of transformers uh, has significantly improved the accuracy of models, which is the purple arrow, how improving that technique is driving better results. But also we're seeing is increasing scale of application that hyperscalers like OpenAI and Google and others are putting increasing resources into their models and showing uh, impressive results in how those models work. So we see, so one is there's a trend of both improvements through continued research innovations, as well as through increasing uh, resources being put into training the models. This, this diagram from another paper shows how much of the increase is happening from different sources. You know, that 
over a five-year period, about 25 times improvement in AI models from improved algorithms, uh, about eight times growth from, uh, it calls it Moore's law, but let's just say hardware efficiency, which is often because of increasing specialization of, for example, increased uh, ability to get parallelization and tensor pipelining in, in GPU chips. Um, but that most of it is really coming from increasing the resources that are being used uh, so that these record setting, but, you know, benchmark results uh, for performance are coming largely from a rapid increase in the amount of resources that are being spent. Now, this is indicative of obviously tremendous value, um, especially in, in big tech, but it's also presents an interesting context for how, how this will play out going forward, right? Will we continue to see this rapid increase where the largest companies are investing tens of billions of dollars in AI compute? How will that affect uh, plans for research? You know, certainly our perspective is that there's a lot of interesting work to do in, in the improvement on the purple line of improving techniques rather than racing to match the scale. Um, and that we think that a lot of times you can get commercially useful results without having to execute at the extreme scale. But it's an interesting context for the field as compute continues to accelerate. Let's look at some of the applications of AI. You probably know many of the applications of AI in large technology firms. When you think about it, uh, one of the areas with the biggest impact, and uh, as we'll talk about some of the, uh, the challenges, is the use of AI techniques to improve search and recommendations. Um, the language modeling techniques, BERT, um, have been significant improvements for Google search, as in this blog post. You know, Facebook has open sourced um, deep learning recommendation models that are uh, obviously critical in their business for their news feed. Um, and of course, we've seen all kinds of new products that are possible now with AI techniques that were not commercially successful before because the quality of the speech detection and generation and language understanding underneath them has reached a threshold of utility, right? So whether it's Siri or Alexa or a uh, Google Assistant, the virtual assistants are all good examples of valuable applications that are really helping people um, at home. So those are these are all examples that you're probably familiar with of how AI techniques can be, or AI is being applied in technology firms. But there's, Beyond tech, tech firms, you know, AI has a big role to play in some of the large challenges we have in society. One of the obvious ones is climate change. When you look at it, there's numerous areas where people are applying AI techniques to address the challenges, whether it be improving uh, detecting and predicting deforestation to allow proactive response, whether it be uh, materials discovery for batteries and fuel cells. Materials discovery is an important area of research at the Vector Institute. A uh, number of uh, uh, researchers and uh, the faculty and students conducting research. And likewise, you know, using re reinforcement learning to optimize energy management. Some of the first applications for that are in the data center. In fact, we've even had you know, one of our industry sponsors uh, achieve success in using these techniques in one of our collaboration projects. So driving improved energy efficiency and operating, whether it be a factory, a home, or a data center are all important opportunities. We're also applying AI in healthcare. So at, at Vector Institute, we're, we collaborate with a number of hospital partners and the Ministry of Health, and we have done projects to help with radiology, to help improve diagnosis of patients. And also we have done projects to integrate multiple signals to do a good, uh, pre, uh, excuse me, predict cardiac arrest, to identify a patient who's at risk of a heart attack about five minutes in advance of actually them having a heart attack, which can have a huge impact on survivability for patients. So these are areas of application of AI techniques that can have a real, uh, make a real difference in healthcare. We're also doing work, although it's, there's not an image, on how can you use natural language processing techniques. You know, it turns out that there's a lot of really rich information in clinical notes, for example, uh, around a patient's case that are 
not as easily accessed, but can be very informative, right? So we're doing uh, research on how to make those that technique valuable, as well as have done work on operational efficiency scheduling inside hospitals that again, can have a big impact on the delivery of healthcare. One of the areas that we spend a lot of time and certainly my engineering team at Vector spends a lot of time is in industry collaboration projects. This is where we work with sponsors to take some of the leading research and test how it can be useful in real problems that they have in their business. So as one example to dive into, we've done work with sponsors to address some of these advances in natural language processing that I was talking about. How can these large language models be applied in, in specific industry domains and used to solve problems, right? So we did a project um, a little while ago and we had uh, these three sponsors all have been examples of achieving meaningful results. So the first one that I'm gonna highlight on the left is Thomson Reuters, where in their legal search system that where you do question, have questions and it produces answers, they were able to apply state-of-the-art uh, large language models to improve the way they would generate features and rank them, right? So while eventually it would be desirable to do more of this through ML techniques, um, by being able to improve two steps of a pipeline in their production system, they got significant improvements. Um, and this was really facilitated by a collaboration project um, that we <clears throat> held, including giving access to our large GPU compute cluster that our researchers use, that are so our industry collaboration projects can use. Um, similarly, Manulife had success in uh, using uh, language models to identify customer uh, pain points to analyze interactions in the contact center. And the Bank of Montreal had success by analyzing sentiment in financial markets using natural language processing. So all examples of how we can, uh, you can apply state-of-the-art NLP techniques to diverse business problems that can generate real impact in deployment. You know, we've also done collaboration projects with industry partners on integrating health data, on dealing with the data set shifts, obviously top of mind through the pandemic as so many uh, trends and so many assumptions were broken. How do you manage a machine learning model when suddenly your, your distribution has shifted radically? And indeed, model-based reinforcement learning, which led to the energy optimization outcome I talked about. We're also currently engaged in a collaboration project on computer vision, where as engineer, the engineering team, we're making it much easier to work with a variety of data sets and apply transforms and make it easier to test a range of activities like tracking activities in a video, as well as dealing with questions of robustness in images, in uh, real world uh, image problems. And we're also working on open sourcing a rich high resolution data set for improving research and industry applications with one of our sponsors. So those are some examples of how we're collaborating and applying research at Vector and more broadly what's happening in industry. So hopefully you can see that the range of applications of deep learning techniques has, is quite exciting and there's a lot of opportunity across the economy, whether it be in improving the efficiency of business, opening up new products, enabling startups and larger scale technology firms, enabling healthcare applications and broader tackling of societal issues like climate change. Now let's turn to a few of the challenges that I see in ahead. Well, broadly in adopting AI, I think that you can look at it as there's, there can be challenges from a business or organizational perspective, there's technology challenges, there's challenges in the people and in ethics. So, you know, I would say broadly at the Vector Institute, you know, we think about how do we enable uh, organizations to be successful and incrementally adopt AI by addressing all of these. Um, but just as context and, you know, what I'd say is most large organizations have some sense of a digital transformation of how they're changing the way they work based on an increasingly digital world. No surprise, the last year has meant a significant acceleration of this in many organizations as suddenly much more had to be done digitally and needed to have less physical interactions. So that's been an accelerating trend, but it's also a long-term trend. 
and it leads to the ability to create data, but also um, a, an importance around a strategy of what data should you be acquiring and how should you be acquiring it, as well as a business strategy. You know, what I still see is so often leaders of businesses, organizations are not, don't have a deep understanding of what is and isn't possible with AI techniques. And so ideating, what are the things that you can really do with today's machine learning models that can be impactful? How can you build systems using machine learning that can be really game-changing is still something that most organizations need a lot of help on. And it's often a, a real important um, way of working together between technical experts, between data scientists, machine learning engineers, and, and uh, business leaders to exchange knowledge and to figure out what can be done? How do you break down what's being done? What are the pieces that are really suitable for rethinking or revising to take advantage of what's now possible, right? So a lot of organizations are still uh, at an early stage of understanding what AI can do. And you see organizations coming up with ideas that are either infeasible, um, you know, uses of AI that you know, we don't know how to build, for example, a general purpose chat bot that would answer any query with great accuracy, right? It's easy to imagine how that'd be useful in a business, but it's not possible to build such a thing, right? So it's it's about the art of taking what models are being built and think about how they can scale into a business, which is why the kind of proof of concepts collaborations tied to business needs are so important. We also offer education courses to help business leaders get more up to speed in this area. So that's on the business side. On the technology side, many organizations still have challenges with data readiness, which is to say they may have a lot of data that they're able to collect, but are they collecting it? Are they integrating it? Is it in a form of quality? Is it made available in a way that's useful to data scientists? Needless to say, machine learning systems require training on large amounts of data. And so having data available is critical. Likewise, systems integration. So many organizations I see know how to do a proof of concept of a machine learning system, but they don't know how to really integrate it into a production workflow, or they're too risk averse to do so, or they don't know how to have the ML ops skills to maintain it, which brings me to people and skills. Many organizations are aggressively building their skills, their talent for AI. And of course, that's a great opportunity for those attending this conference to play a role, whether it be as a data scientist, an engineer, or indeed as a, a new generation of business leader in product management or business management who's deeply aware of AI and thinking about how it has an impact. It's also incredibly important to understand the governance. How is the end-to-end -end process of AI? How do you have cross-functional teams apply it in various domains. Most organizations I see today have a center of excellence model where they centralize a lot of their talent for AI and they don't distribute it out across the, the business units and the products. Um, but uh, large tech firms do it the opposite because they tend to have enough talent that they can have enough scale that they have a large distributed talent in the different uh, products and they still have a small centralized consulting team. I would say that uh, as AI becomes more integrated into larger amounts of business, that more companies will follow that model. But right now it makes sense that many are still having most of their talent in a center of excellence. And I'll talk more about some of the ethical challenges here since the theme of this conference is on adopting responsibly. And I think in fact, um, given some of the reputational risk and some of the, the, the natural concern in society about some of how big tech is affecting society, uh, being responsible isn't an option in the same way that, you know, developing safe systems and developing quality systems is important. Broader responsibility topics are important. So let me address a few examples of areas where uh, there are real concerns about the ethics. One is around bias. So we've you've probably heard examples like at the end of 2019, when there were, uh, there was an investigation of Apple Card based on prominent case where it was, uh, and it was David Hanemeyer Hansen uh, was approved for a much larger credit line than his wife. And it led to questions about gender discrimination in their algorithms. Similarly, there was uh, a, a, a unfortunate outcome where a healthcare 
uh, algorithm ended up producing racially biased outcomes because the uh, their proxy for what's the healthcare risk was what was historical spend on healthcare. So you had a ba- you were training on a biased system that had predicted uh, you know basically under allocated care, and so therefore it predicted less, less need for care going forward. So it was perpetuating a kind of bias. Um, but also an interesting example of it wasn't it isn't enough to do something simple like oh let's just make sure there's enough representation of different races in the training data. In this case, the system itself was producing biased outcomes that you didn't want to perpetuate. The similar example when Amazon scrapped an AI based hiring tool that was perpetuating gender discrimination in their hiring practices. And then this diagram on the bottom left shows another kind of uh, bias where here you had a um, a GAN that was filling in a blurry image to come up with a super resolution, more accurate representation of a person. But you can see when it was fed in a blurry image of Barack Obama, it fills in a sharp image of a white man, right? So indicating how you can have a kind of representational harm, right? Where in a similar example, translation systems have taken uh, languages that have uh, non-gendered pronouns and they would translate them into a male pronoun for stereotypically male professions like doctor and a female pronoun for uh, stereotypically female professions like nurse, right? So these are all examples of bias that can be uh, un, you know, perpetuated or created through uh, AI systems. So bias is certainly a topic of a lot of consideration. More broadly, AI systems are having a big impact on our society, right? So when you think about how much information is being mediated by AI, you know, so much of the the news and the information we get comes from large scale technology platforms that use AI to manage search and recommendations. You know, we we see examples like um, you know concerns around divisiveness at Facebook, um, conspiracy theory recommendations at YouTube. Uh, more recently, um, a good uh, example of a, a paper showing how powerful language models like GPT-3 can be used to generate uh, radical manifestos, you know, so that these technologies can be used by bad actors to create, for example, misinformation and uh, basically automate. You know, if there's benign uses where companies are using language models to do copywriting for ads, you know, using them to spread radicalization manifestos is a problem. You know, we also can be concerned about the robustness of machine learning models. And that's a good example here of, we've, we've probably all seen adversarial training examples, but this one really lands with me of, you have a self-driving uh, vehicle from NVIDIA and when fed with a normal image, it knows to turn left on the road. But just by adjusting the lighting of the image with small adjustments, it suddenly gets confused and wants to veer off the road. Right. Obviously, that's a safety critical example of lack of robustness. And similarly, in, in many of the domains we've talked about where it's high stakes, it's not acceptable to have a system that is lacking in robustness. You know, if, if it knows that it's not confident, if you could tell it, look, this is not a situation I understand, I'm going to stop, that would be a lot safer than having it confidently drive off the road. And then there are also concerns about malicious uses of AI, like killer, uh, you know, automated weapon systems, or indeed uh, authoritarian states like China using AI systems for mass surveillance. And likewise, concerns about the increasing arms race of deep fakes, the ability to generate incredibly accurate uh, fake images using AI techniques, which will continue to be a bigger and bigger problem, something that we all need to be thinking about. You know, can you trust? We already have seen how much, for example, textual misinformation can be uh, impactful. You know, misinformation spread in a video form with deep fakes can be incredibly uh, damaging. We've seen, you know, not even deep fakes that have been crudely altered have gotten a lot of traction, let alone true deep fakes. So it's another concern. With that in mind, let's talk briefly about the question of responsible AI and how uh, what can be done to address some of these challenges. Broadly, I think you have a foundation of technology. You know, how do you build the responsibility and by design and what are the tools and standards you can use? You should have an inclusive process and real governance 
to ensure that the way you build systems bakes in responsibility, then you have a strategy where you have ethical guidelines and take responsibility as an organization. I want to emphasize, though, that responsibility um, is a complex concern like quality. It's not a simple engineering problem to solve. I think we always have to balance, you know, wanting to have well-defined problems we can solve and make progress, but not confusing that because we've solved a technical problem that we've necessarily solved the underlying question, right? Like questions of ethics and fairness and, and uh, robustness, these are complex trade-offs in society is never done. We're always making progress and we're always weighing trade-offs. You know, even simple things like, you know, there's often a trade-off between fairness and privacy. Uh, you know, you can collect a lot more data to try to make a system fairer, but at some point you're creating an uncomfortable uh, surveil amount of surveillance and tracking that may, may run afoul of uh, privacy concerns. There's some good technologies out there. You know, there's ways of both building more interpretable models as well as post hoc interpretation of models to have better understanding of them. There's an active area of research in that. Likewise, you know, in fairness, there's ways of analyzing systems for fairness, giving metrics on, on different ways, especially for classifiers and various ways of remediating through the life cycle. In terms of privacy, there's lots of technologies for analysis, there's federated learning, some great work that uh, we're doing at Vector, uh, Professor Nicolas Paperno and his students are doing on, on uh, being able to do uh, distributed learning uh, that can be both uh, secure and private or confidential and private. And then, you know, we're, we'll, as I'll touch on, thinking about how to have better objectives in AI systems, how to really uh, formulate concerns of more stakeholders and weigh in a uh, broader range of concerns than simple clickstream information can give you. I'm not gonna drain this slide, but you can see there's lots to think about in terms of even one area, mitigating bias, how you can work on the data, the algorithms, the metrics, and the systems to address fairness. And hopefully also out of this, you can see that the question of how do you, first of all, I, don't like the term de-bias because you'll never remove bias from anything, but how you can mitigate bias in your system and, and get visibility into it is an important thing to be thinking about. And there's lots of useful applications. This is an example of research um, done by researchers at the Vector Institute, um, which uh, is a, using adversarial techniques to come up with uh, representations that make it basically hard to recover a protected attribute. Um, so somewhat like a generative adversarial network, but in this case, you basically come up with a representation of data that can still be useful for a task like granting a loan or hiring, but you can show that it's basically not possible to recover a protected attribute like gender or race from that representation. This work's been extended to more complex scenarios, but this one captures the core idea. So with that, let me summarize the some of the projects we have in process at Vector and Schwartz Reisman. Um, you know, we we're working with sponsors on trustworthy AI, both from a governance and risk management perspective, and also a technical implementation perspective that leads to topics like fairness and explainability work. Which you know we're also working on. Uh, how do you actually detect and remediate uh, unfair bias, and what are the trade offs of that? Explaining. You know, how do you explain, you know, inter better interpret models and train more interpretable models in different scenarios? You know, coming up with better objectives in AI systems, focusing on recommendation systems in particular, right? What are ways of incorporating survey data or content analysis to improve the way a recommendation system works rather than responding solely to short-term user click data? Um, and then finally, Trusted Data Lab, which is a partnership about creating both legal and technical infrastructure. The latest privacy bill in, in Bill C-11, the federal government has tabled as interesting idea of codes of practice. Can you actually codify and make it possible to both move faster and have better privacy practices, testing some of the innovative uh, machine learning techniques that uh, are being developed? So these are all examples of some of the kind of projects we're doing, uh, you know, focused on responsible AI. So I would just leave here, conclude with a few key points. One is that AI research is creating uh, great opportunities 
uh, great opportunities to apply and to have a real impact on society. You know, we have a real need to build the digital foundations to gather the data and to have the right skills to enable this possibility and tremendous opportunity with Canada's investment in AI for Canada to be a world leader in this area. Um, you know, that we think responsible AI is urgent for society and is really going to be critical to unlock this value and to enable AI to continue to have the potential it can have. So I'm excited for the potential in applying AI. We're excited. We're building our engineering team at Vector. You know, we have internships as well as hiring for full time. So certainly would love to hear if people are interested. And, you know, our sponsors are increasingly many of them hiring uh, for AI talent. So there's lots of opportunities, whether you want to work at a place like Vector, whether you want to work at an exciting startup. You know, we have lots of startups and scale ups in our ecosystem, applying AI in exciting ways, as well as larger organizations, many of our sponsors, large enterprises in Canada that are applying AI. So there's tremendous opportunities for your career to do meaningful, positive work in AI, lots of applications to be had. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll pause and, and see if there's time for a few questions. Hey, Ron. Yeah, that was an awesome presentation. You touched on like a lot of really exciting interesting. Um, you covered like a lot of the uh, ground in the field of AI. Um, I think one topic I really like there that you, you've touched on for a while was like the idea of algorithmic bias and bias in data. And I always like when that one comes up, and it definitely pertains a lot to our, our theme this year. Uh, and I think a lot, a couple other um, uh, speakers will be touching on that topic as well. And it's definitely going to come up in our uh, pitch competition. Uh, so I really like that one. And honestly, all, all around was an awesome presentation. So uh, yeah, we'll take some questions from the audience now. Um, just like we spoke about before, I'm going to throw up the banners on screen so you'll be able to see them and I'll, I'll read them off for everyone here. So um, yeah, about that that topic you touched on in the end about getting involved with Vector, um, this question pertains to that. So someone asked, how can undergraduate students get involved with the Vector Institute when most of the re researchers are masters or PhD students? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I'd say that I know that um, many of the faculty at Vector do have undergraduate researchers who are uh, who are collaborating with them. So I would uh, I would try to uh, to connect with one of the uh, the faculty members in you know, one of the, the CIFAR AI chairs who's at Vector and talk to them or even you know one of the affiliates, right? We also have, in addition to the core chairs, we have a, a number of distinguished affiliates. Um, so I'd say that undergraduates, you know, building those relationships uh, with professors uh, to identify research opportunities for undergraduates, working with them is a great way to, to do it. I know we've, uh, I've had a chance to, one of our, uh, the other, the other possibility is um, internships, right? So we have uh, internships that are open to undergraduates. So I'm, we have one of those that's posted right now, and we are looking for people to do internships both over the summer and, you know, part-time during the school year. So if you have a strong background in machine learning and you're interested in an engineering internship or other kinds of internships, you know, we have internships as well. Okay. Awesome. Um, okay. This is a cool one about uh, some of the health projects you've done. So someone asked related to the health projects you worked on, uh, what's being done to advance the scale of biometric data collection? And also, how can we ensure privacy with biometric data collection? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I'd say certainly uh, privacy is always top of mind, you know, and the associated security that's necessary with any health data. And so, you know, we spend a lot of time thinking about how do we make sure we can, in a responsible way, enable research with uh, that the sensitive data. You know, broadly, there's a, a lot of, uh, emphasis on de-identification of data, but uh, you know, de-identification is not a. It's it's not very hard to have data that cannot cannot be re-identified. So, you know, stronger protections uh, around privacy are really important, right? So that includes technical controls, includes training. You know, so there's um, there's a lot that goes into enabling effective research. You know, I think the other thing is, you know, we, we are working with, you know, we're, we're working with partners that have some interesting biometric data. I think <coughs> broadly, there is um, there is a, um, a lack of, some, there's not a simple story of like, there's an 
anybody that's collected a lot of biometric data and makes it easily available for health research, right? That you tend to have islands of biometric data in different places and a lot of questions around how can users opt in and enable it to be used for effective research. So I think it's still a fairly nascent field. Um, it's definitely an area we're invested in and we are uh, working with some different uh, partners around enabling innovative research with biometric data. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think it, the, the good news is in some sense, it may be easier to, uh, to have de-identified biometric data. It may be harder to recover identities than with other techniques. So, you know, definitely an area that we think is super important. Awesome. Yeah, great response. Um, okay, another question we have, what ethical challenges are uh, presented when predicting consumer trends? Is there any other way for targeted advertising? Yeah, I think it's a great question. There's a, um, there's a real balance here of what, what kind of um, recommendation or, or targeted advertising is comfortable and what type is, is creepy or manipulative, right? And, and I, don't think there's, um, I don't think there's a simple binary answer to this one either, right? I think people wanna have opt-in controls, right? I think the idea, and, and I think that e even now a lot of the opt-in where it, they basically give you a really easy button to opt-in and make it very hard through a series of sub clicks to say, please don't track me. <laughs> That's not really what uh, I think is a fair version of opt-in and, and certainly not what I understand legislation like GDPR stipulates, right? So I think first of all, opting in, second of all is transparency. Don't deceive consumers about what you're doing, right? Like um, there was an article a little over a year ago about how Amazon search <coughs> is now really increasingly optimizing for um, what does a consumer, uh, what, what's going to be profitable for Amazon? Um, this was in the Wall Street Journal. Whereas, uh, you know, most people would assume that I'm doing a product search that it's trying to find products that match the intent of my search, right? So that's a factor. I think in the same way, um, if you have uh, advertising that's mixed in with organic search results or affecting search, that that's going to be viewed as manipulative. Whereas if you have something that's clearly identified, this is an ad, people more understand, well, there's ads here. I'd also say you can target advertising without getting right down to individual characteristics, right? You can target ads based on the context. You know, there's, there's work around how do you have larger cohorts without getting down to individual information. And, you know, it's a trade-off. You can still have ads can still be effective based on some of these other signals that just be less effective than having all the data extremely tailored models. But um, the other thing I, I'll, I'll plug is I turn off personalized ads in Google and I'm very happy to do so. I haven't felt any loss. So, you know, it's actually an option that at least Google provides, not so much Facebook where I can basically remove myself from a few thousand lists that I've been added to on Facebook, but I can't really turn it off personalized ads as far as I could tell. Um, so, you know, I think it's, it's one of many areas where uh, we're ripe for uh, legislative uh, redress. Okay, yeah, wonderful response. Um, I just want to point out one of the questions uh, that we've received is regarding um, the environmental impacts of like large deep learning models. That's actually a wonderful question, but we're going to actually postpone that to the ethics and AI panel because that's actually a topic that we'll be discussing there. So whoever asked that, great job. Um, that's a that's a wonderful question, but we'll we'll talk a bit more about that later. So I think we have time for maybe one or two more. Um, Here's a good one, actually. So many policymakers do not have a good knowledge of AI. So how can we create AI policy that works for everyone? Well, I think I think it's um, it's an evolving story, right? I mean, w one thing is I do think uh, more and more uh, policymakers and, and government ministers and their their departments are ramping up, especially those that have a portfolio that touches on AI. So I think sometimes that that's a bit of uh, a dated perspective, um, but I'd also say that, um, you know, I think I, I'm really a fan of uh, Dr. Jillian Hadfield, at who leads the schwartz Riesman Institute idea of regulatory markets. And the idea is that instead of us trying to codify into law 
all of the things that we need to happen in such a fast moving field. We, we, we set instead a higher set of principles that need to be followed. And then we enable private innovation, say, look, companies need to certify themselves as complying with best practices in these areas, but you can choose from a variety of private companies to implement that, right? So it's kind of like an audit function, but hopefully one that's more technology focused. So more based on actually not, not just going through the process and checking the box and you did things in a certain process, but you actually have technical verification of specifics of, for example, what is the bias in an algorithm and does it meet the threshold that you've stated, right? So um, I think there's a ton of opportunity to unleash regulatory innovation to keep up with the pace of AI, but more broadly, other areas of technology advance. So that's what I'm excited about. You know, I think there's a lot of good work going into standardization around AI, but you know, I think we have to uh, we have to have regulation that can keep up with the pace of change. Okay, yeah, that was a great answer. Um, there's a lot of awesome questions rolling in, but unfortunately, we're going to have to move on to our our next speaker presenter. Um, so thank you very much for that presentation, Ron. That was actually terrific, and uh, and great responses to the questions as well. Thank you. Look forward to the panel this afternoon. Awesome.